Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the tutorial. Uh, so today is going to be a bit shorter than before. Um, so I guess it's it's just the 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 list of the topic is quite short. Uh, so first we're going to consider um, like a topic which is close to the to the to topics of the lectures. So previously in the lectures, uh, when we were considering this tomography protocol, uh, we derived a bound on probability um, for the state estimate rho tilde to be um, epsilon further away from, um, from, from the desired true state uh, up to the n iterations. And this was the case we considered it was for the qubits. So now we'll try to see how that bound looks for uh, d dimensional case. So, say in class, so in lecture, we've seen that the probability of the fact that the trace uh, norm is bigger than epsilon is less than six e to the power minus tunant n epsilon squared. So this was derived in the lecture and this was for qubits. And now we want to see what happens if we apply the same protocol in d dimensions. Uh, so what, what can we say about uh, the state of the, of the quantum system in d dimensions? Uh, well, analogously to the to the case uh, to the to the uh, qubit case, you can always um, you can always write the state of the qubit uh, in an analogous block representation. So say that rho is a d-level system state of the D-level system. Then we can always write that rho is equal to one over D identity plus sum from K equal one to D squared minus one uh, CK sigma K. So basically, uh, the, the states can be mapped to the, into elements of R D squared minus one. So basically in a, in a two dimensional, in a two dimensional system for a qubit, you could map the states um, as being inside this block ball. Uh, whereas here uh, you can map for the d-dimensional system, you can always map them to, um, to, to the sphere, sorry, to the ball and uh, d square minus one dimensions. And these matrices, um, yeah, they can be generalized Pauli matrices for, uh, for d-dimensions, and they must, they must. Uh, they must satisfy two things. So first, uh, yeah, of course, first they must be Hermitian. Second, uh, they must be traceless. And third, the trace of sigma j sigma k should equal d delta j k. Uh, yeah, so this is just a generalization of the view that we had uh, for the qubits to a d-dimensional system. And so, uh, yeah, so again, uh, the CKs can also be written into this uh, vector R, as we did in the lecture, uh, which, which shows you where the state is. And then, uh, I'll just quickly walk you through the argument that you can, ana which is analogous to the argument that was shown in the lecture, but uh, for this case. 
in d dimensions. So basically the first thing is how, how, are, how are these R's connected to, or maybe I'll just call them RK just to be consistent. So RK from R1 to RK squared minus one. So how are they connected uh, to, the, uh, to the norm of rho minus rho tilde? Uh, so in this, in this scheme, if we want to apply the same tomographic scheme that we, that we used in a lecture, here we need to do uh, d, d squared minus one measurements in each iteration uh, because we have uh, d, d squared minus one elements this vector, and then the components of this vector satisfy, this is analogous to what we've seen in the lecture. Maybe I'll pick out some more, less dying marker. Uh, Ri minus Ri tilde squared equal to d over d squared minus one rho minus rho tilde two squared. So this is uh, this is easy to see by just write, writing out this as basically a trace of uh, rho minus rho tilde squared, and then writing rho and rho tilde in terms of uh, that low decomposition. Okay, uh, so having written this, and also uh, knowing the relations between different norms, like the trace norm, one norm, and two norm, we can write the uh, the statement for the probabilities uh, of finding of of the estimate state being away from the target true state. So. The probability of it being, of this difference being larger than epsilon is less or equal than the probability. I think all the markers are dying. Uh, let me try my own one. Less or equal, yes. Less or equal than the probability of The second norm being bigger than two or square root of d epsilon. Uh, so to show this as a hint, you just need to establish the, I think we already did it in the lecture, uh, the, like the connection between the two norm and the trace norm. And uh, particularly this can be done via the one norm. And then for the one norm, we would have this relation. Okay, so now we're working with this and we, we see like from, from, from this equation here that we can uh, rewrite this, uh, the two norm in terms of these components of the vector Ri. So in fact, this is equal to the probability of one over D sum over all components Ri minus Ri tilde squared uh, bigger. Ah, oh, yeah. So the first, of course, the first, uh, the first thing we do, we we say that this is squared, right? If this is squared, then this is four epsilon squared d. And then here we have four epsilon squared over d. Okay, 
Here again, we do the trick in a lecture that we substitute the sum uh, with an uh, or. So we get that this is less than probability of taking or over all components of the sum. Uh, and here we need to account also that there is d squared minus one elements of the sum. So we would get uh, like this, I think. Yes. Uh, okay. And si similarly, as in the lecture, we can bound this by the exponent. So it's going to be less or equal than d squared minus 1, uh, e to the power of minus n d epsilon squared over 2 d squared minus 1. And this is can be written like that we, we just disregard the 1 here. So we get d squared uh, e to the power minus n d epsilon squared over um, so get uh, of d d squared minus 1 epsilon squared d squared. Yes, I think this should work. Okay. Uh, and let us call this eta. And basically, if we call this eta, then we would see that um, actually this protocol, if we use it for d-dimensional systems, it doesn't work as good um, as it works for qubits. So it wouldn't be optimal in that sense. Why? Because here, to um, for this ex exponent to be sufficiently small, you need to take uh, n over an order of d squared. And uh, But remember that in ev every iteration, so we need to do at least d squared iterations. Um, but in every iteration, we should also do d squared minus 1 measurements. Uh, so basically, the number of measurements that we have to do is basically at least proportional to d to the 4. Um, and when in, in, in the case of qubits, this is not so big. Like already in the case of three-dimensional systems, this is quite... Uh, yeah, quite large. Okay. Uh, yes, there might be some typos in there because I haven't uh, carried out the, this derivation myself yet. I hope I'll do it for the solution. Uh, but basically what you can do is take the calculation for the qubits and write it uh, for the case, for the dimensional case when we can write the... Uh, the density matrix in this way. And that will be kind of your solution. And you can already kind of see that uh, already from the fact that the number of measurements each time has to be like around d squared. And uh, the number of iterations should be at least d squared. This is not a good, op this is not an optimal way for an arbitrary dimensional system. Okay. Uh, so I think this exercise concludes everything that we wanted to say about uh, tomography of quantum states, at least in this course. Uh, and now the second exercise is uh, the one I think we should, we should have had before. It's about Renyi entropies. So I know you've already seen them in the course before. Uh, but you were just given them as they are and not 
uh, and you haven't done the actual uh, derivation of their limit cases. So I'll just like uh, run you through through them because this is one of the entropies that are most widely used in uh, quantum information theory. So basically, uh, this is a generalization of the Shannon entropy that you already know. And uh, we'll define it classically, but of course it can be also extended to the quantum case. Uh, so we have a vector of probabilities P, like with the elements PI, and then we can define the Rennie entropy as, as alpha of P. And for now, I'll define it just for uh, alpha bigger than, bigger or uh, equal than zero. Uh, so it's gonna be minus one over alpha minus one logarithm sum from I e uh, 1 to m p i to the power alpha and of course you, as you can see from the definition there are already some borderline cases like for example um, yeah alpha equals 1 alpha equals infinity and uh, yeah alpha equals 0 okay and uh, there and in this few special cases actually uh, we can uh, we can see that this this entropy converges to some already known entropic quantity such as like normal Shannon entropy, um, yeah mean entropy and max entropy. Mm. And so let us just calculate that. So first let us take the case alpha equals zero. Uh, so what we want to calculate is the limit of S alpha of P as alpha goes to zero. We'll call it S zero of P. And S zero of P is, um, so we're calculating the limit of alpha going to zero of minus one over alpha minus one logarithm of the sum. Uh, okay, so with this with this expression here, we don't have a problem. So this is just going to be one. Uh, here, what happens here? So first, which elements would survive in this sum? Um, of course, if we have an element uh, which is zero, it's, it will give zero contribution. So, and if the element pi is not zero, then it will give a contribution equaling one. So basically what we would have is log uh, sum uh, of ones for all pi's which are non-zero. And this will give us basically the number of non-zero elements in this probability vector which is, um, which is called a rank of the vector. And maybe you've already seen this uh, this measure before. It's called uh, max entropy. Okay. Uh, now let us consider the next case, which is alpha equals one. Uh, so now we want to calculate S1 of P, which is the limit of alpha going to one minus, I'm gonna write this as explicitly um, a division. So logarithm of the sum over alpha minus one. Okay, so uh, here to derive this limit, we need to use um, a rule from analysis, which I think 
is not so commonly used. Um, so we need to use this um, L'Hopital rule. And the L'Hopital rule is basically for the following. So if we have, if we want to calculate the following limit, let's say it's, um, uh, we wanted to calculate the limit of this uh, uh, division of function f by function g. And these two functions are such that at this point they both have limit zero. So they both converge to zero at this point. Then this limit is equal to the limit of uh, their derivatives. Uh, yes, um, okay, of course, of course, I think in, uh, in analysis, you also, they also need to satisfy some nice, uh, um, some other nice conditions, which, uh, like for example, these functions, I think have to be like continuous and have a well-defined derivative and so on, but we're working in physics, so uh, obviously all our functions are, should satisfy that. But what's important, indeed, uh, if we take, yes, if we take limit of alpha going to, uh, to, to one, uh, the, what we have in the denominator would converge to zero, and what we have in nominator would be you would have the sum of um, elements of the probability vector, which is one logarithm of one is zero. So they both satisfy uh, this condition. So we can use it. And what we would get is limit for going to one. I'll put the minus here. It doesn't really matter uh, for the limit. So here we take the uh, derivatives. So in denominator is going to be one, and the denominator um, is going to be logarithm two m. Uh, uh, pi to the power alpha log pi. Uh, yes, and as we take the limit of alpha going to one, what we get is minus logarithm pi. Uh, sorry. Yes, so it's going to be minus sum of pi logarithm pi, which is the usual Shannon entropy. Okay, um, and the final uh, the final limit we want to we want to um, calculate this in is when alpha is infinity. So then S infinity of P is the limit alpha going to infinity of this expression. Sorry, I forgot the log uh, PI to the power. Okay, um, let us suppose that uh, without um, loss of generality that the maximum of PIs is P1. In other case, I can just reshuffle them around since this uh, equation is symmetric with regards to them. So then I can write this out as 
uh, minus limit alpha goes to infinity, one over alpha minus one. Uh, and I separate the sum. So I take out the, the, um, the term of the sum which corresponds to this P1. I can write that this is um, log uh, P1 to the power alpha, which is equal to alpha log P1 plus log of um, so what it gets is uh, if we take out P1 out of each term so basically we would get some over uh, from I equal 1 to M uh, P1 to the power alpha I take out uh, and here I have pi over p1 um, to the power alpha. And so here I would get uh, so square root from the two. Uh, so and p1 to the power alpha plus this. So what I will get is p1 to the power alpha one plus the sum. And so here I would get the logarithm of this sum. plus one plus the sum okay so because uh and now we want to take the limit of this as um alpha goes to infinity and if you look at the sum all elements of the sum are less than one so because pi over p1 is um, less less than one, uh, and when we and then in the limit of alpha going to infinity, this element would actually go to zero, and this logarithm would, would go to zero, and we would be left with just the limit of. This and alpha over. Um, alpha minus one would give us one in the limit of alpha going to infinity and we'll be left with simply minus logarithm p1 or inputting the uh, what we actually had as p1 is the maximum of all pi's it's the mi minus log maximum over all elements of the probability vector uh, and this is called uh, mean entropy. Okay. Uh, now a few properties of these of these entropies. Um, I will not explicitly prove all of them, but I'll show you the way. Um, so. So first is um, the property that all these all these Rennie entropies they're uh, sure concave, and to prove that the function is sure concave, the the easiest way to do so is to use the um, was it Ostrogaski criterion? 
I forgot the first person in the name. Was it Shur again? Um, so Shur Ostrovsky, yes, exactly. So properties all S alpha are Shur concave. So the property that we need to check is the Shur Ostrovsky criterion for which you basically need to calculate the derivative uh, with respect to uh, P pi. So you would need to, to show that pi minus pj uh, multiplied by ds alpha by dpi minus ds alpha by dpj is less or equal than zero. From this it follows that s alpha is a sure concave. Okay. Uh, and this is generally a good criterion to keep in mind uh, when you want to prove that something is sure convex or concave. Like in case of convexity here, the sign just changes. Uh, okay. Uh, then the next, the next property is that all Rennie entropies Um, are between zero. Uh, so which, so do you know which uh, distribution will correspond to zero? Yes, exactly. So that's a pure distribution. And like if you take the definition of, um, of of the entropy and plug in the pure distribution, you would get zero, and um, log m or log, let's say, uh, yes, log m, where m is uh, the number of dimensions in our probability distribution, and this will correspond to uh, like maximally mixed or uniform distribution. Uh, so basically you can write the following that zero as infinity is alpha as zero log m because it's also um, S alpha is non-increasing with respect uh, to, to alpha. So to show this, you just need to take the derivative of S alpha with respect to alpha and show that it's less or equal than zero. And from this, this follows strictly uh, because you also know that, for example, S infinity is always bigger uh, or equal to zero because it's minus log the probability, maximum probability, and S zero is always less or equal than log M because S zero is log rank P and the maximum rank of P is M. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, so these were just the Rennie entropies. One last thing is as for any entropy, we can from the Rennie entropy for one probability distribution, we can get the Rennie entropy uh, relative entropy between two probability distributions. So
which you also seen in a course before. So for two distributions P and Q, we define it as the following. So here comes the sign uh, alpha minus one uh, logarithm m uh, pi to the power alpha qi one to the power one minus alpha. Uh, and the sine function is its usual plus one if alpha bigger than zero, minus one if it's less than zero. And similarly to how we consider the limits uh, for the for just the entropy of one distribution, one can show that in the limit of alpha going to one, this S alpha PQ just gives us the usual um, usual conditional entropy between two probability distributions P and Q, which is uh, the sum of PIs log PI over QI. Uh, is there a minus? There must be minus. Okay, uh, but here, basically, you it's the, the process is the same. You need to again use the uh, Laputa rule. I think that's the only trick, uh, like non-trivial trick in this derivations. Uh, okay, um, as I said, it, this will be quite short, so. This is, I think, everything I wanted to say for today. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please ask me. Uh, just with un one caveat, like the tomographic uh, protocols on the on like for d for finding out the constructing quantum states is very far away from the area of my expertise. So if you have very intricate questions on that, I would redirect you to Marco. Um, okay, yes, thank you.